Hello, my name is Lisa Haywood. I work for the Bureau of Wellness at the Department of Education. And today's video is an introduction to online learning. Um, this is a session um, geared towards middle and high school administrators and teachers. And it's geared towards teachers and administrators who use an LMS, a learning management system, such as Blackboard, Canvas, Moodle, Desire to Learn, um, Google Classrooms as part of their instruction. So I've got a slideshow and I'm going to go over some best practices with you. Um, you can watch this as many times as you want. It's um, free um, and I'm available at the Department of Education if you have any follow-up questions for me. So I'm going to share my screen now. And here we go. So here we go. Um, welcome. This is an introduction to online learning. The biggest thing, the biggest problem in the online learning environment that prevents students from learning is anxiety. Students are accustomed to learning in a brick and mortar institution. And when they move into the online environment, they don't know what to expect and they're full of anxiety. And this anxiety prevents learning from happening. So when a student or a teacher first starts teaching and learning in the online environment, in addition to the academic content, really the focus should be on reducing student anxiety. So in this session, we're going to focus on some ways to reduce student anxiety. We're going to be talking about the um, establishing your presence, setting consistent expectation, some best practices for engaging students and organizing your content. And throughout the session, you're going to see that my focus will be on how to reduce anxiety as you go through all of these different elements. Before we start, um, let's think about what students feel and experience when they go into a brick and mortar learning environment. So when they show up for school in the morning, when they walk into the building, they know what to expect. They know where their classrooms are. They know what their schedule is like. They know where their lockers are, where the bathrooms are, where they can get food, when they can get food. Um, they know when they walk into a classroom that the teacher will be at the front, the teacher might lecture, the teacher might give examples or group um, projects, the students will do some work, and then the students will transition to their next class. So it's a very safe and predictable environment for the students. And when students feel safe in the environment, they're available to learn. Now, when students walk into an online environment for the first time, they don't know what to expect. Everything is new, everything is different. They haven't had 10 years or seven years or five years of experience in the online environment. They have no idea what to expect. So consequently, they're full of anxiety. And it's going to be our jobs to reduce that anxiety, to create a consistent, stable online learning environment that will reduce their anxiety and make them available to learn. The good news is there are lots of benefits of online learning. And I know that not everybody likes to teach online and not every student is an ideal online student. Likewise, not every teacher is an ideal online teacher or every teacher might not like teaching in the online or digital environment. But here are some of the benefits. Online learning really creates a level playing field for most of the students, not all of them, but most of the students. And I always say, I always give the example, for all of us who have taught in a classroom before, we all know the students who sit at the front of the room, who are very self-confident, who have an immediate answer. They're bright students, they're engaged students. They sit at the front of the classroom and when you ask a question, their hands go up, they're willing and ready to participate. But for students who are more reserved and who might need a little bit more time to think and reflect about things, they don't participate as much in the physical classroom. They might know the answers to your questions, 
They might not be brave enough to raise their hand and risk being exposed or made vulnerable, but they know the answers. But as a teacher in a physical classroom, you only know what you're seeing and hearing. So the students in the back of the room who are more quiet and more reserved, you might not think they know as much as they really know. But in the online environment, every, every student participates and has the opportunity to participate in virtual time. And so the level, level um, the playing field is much more level for them because they're not inhibited by some of the, the social interactions that happen in a traditional classroom. Students have got time to review materials and reflect on questions in virtual time. I might need a little bit longer to read something. I might want to read it quite quickly. I might understand all of it. I might understand some of it. I might want to go back and reflect on the materials that I'm given. I might want to think more carefully about the questions that the teacher is asking me before I respond. At the end of the day, the more thoughtful student who takes a little bit more time might actually be able to give you um, feedback through a written assignment or an oral assignment in the online environment that is at a much higher level than they would in a traditional classroom setting. Online learning environments support the learning theories of the circadian rhythms so that students, especially teenagers, don't function well at eight o'clock in the morning, but they function really well at 10 o'clock at night. So again, in the online environment where you're not necessarily using real time, you're using virtual time, students um, are in, in touch with their circadian rhythms, they're doing their discussion forums or their online homework at 10 o'clock at night and their brains are working better. Another benefit is online reinforces writing skills. It's incredibly text heavy, the online environment. So again, it's not ideal for every student, but it does reinforce reading and writing skills. And believe it or not, there's loads of room for creativity in the virtual environment. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in the slides ahead. So think about the benefits of online learning and how you can um, utilize those benefits as you enter the online learning environment. So in a traditional classroom, students come in, you take attendance, you know they're there, you can affirm their participation. In an online environment or a digital environment, when students feel anxious, they're less likely to log in and they're less likely to participate. So to reinforce your role, in addition to teaching the content, the big focus should be, how can you reduce their anxiety and promote learning? When students know what to expect, when they know what the structure of your online environment is going to look like, they're going to be more willing to log on, participate and learn. So you're going to create a predictive learning environment and a predictive learning community. There are a number of ways that you can do this. First of all, you want to establish your presence. Best practice tips, log on to the course site at least twice a day, but don't log on at random times. Log on at very consistent times and let your students know when you're going to be in the course site. So for example, you might be somebody who's got time to log in between eight and nine o'clock in the morning, and between four and five o'clock in the afternoon. Your whole schedule is gonna change online. It might not be the eight to four or eight to five or seven to six schedule that you're accustomed to. So be flexible, but come up with some times that work with you and your schedule at the moment and consistently log into your course site at those times and let your students know when you're going to be in the course site. Another thing you can do is establish a daily open office hour or hours. So an open office hour is um, a space in the virtual classroom. It might be a chat room, it might be a Zoom room, it could be any combination of those, when you're going to be available for anyone to drop in. I'm using Zoom right now, I'm alone, but if I had open Zoom time, three or four participants could log in and talk to me. 
This is a really good forum if there are general questions about assignments or about things going on. Um, but it's not private. So you're going to have students who are probably going to have questions for you that they don't want to ask in front of their peers or parents who might have questions for you. Also establish an opportunity for students and, and parents, if you work with parents, to have a private office hour with you, but make sure this is per request. So you might want to say, I'm, I'll have um, office hours with you privately, but email me two days ahead of time to set them up. So make sure you're available publicly and privately. And above all, communicate this very, very clearly to your students. So here are some examples for establishing consistent presence. And these are the ones that I use in first year college classroom. Um, you can probably adapt them to the middle and high school levels and come up with an example that's much more appropriate than what I can give you. So here's my policy. I've got open office hours by Zoom between eight and nine o'clock and four and 5 p.m. If you want a private office hour, I, I'm okay giving people my phone number, you might not be. Please phone me or email me. I have an email communication policy. I'm going to respond to email within 24 hours during the week and 48 hours on the weekend. It can be anything you want. Otherwise, I'm happy to speak with you, the student, via Zoom or Gmail live chat. But you'll need to schedule it with me ahead of time. And now I've got a grading policy so students know when I'm going to give them feedback so they'll know when I'm going to be present to give them feedback on their work. So my grading is, I'll respond to your discussion forums no later than 12 hours after you've posted. I will grade your assignments no later than two days following the due date of the assignment unless I notify you otherwise. You wanna give yourself some flexibility. And if I approve your work to be submitted late, I'll grade it prior to either midterm grades or final grades. So I've given myself all the flexibility that I want and need as a teacher in this environment. So I've established my presence and I've put it in writing and the students know when and where they can find me and when they can expect feedback from me. Make sure that you have an active and consistent presence in your course site. The results of this are going to be reduced student anxiety. Your anxiety is going to go down. You'll be able to manage your time more effectively and your students will be able to manage your time more effectively. One of the challenges of online learning is that we feel we've got to be online all the time. So we don't give ourselves a break from the teaching. Um, so establish when you're going to be online well ahead of time and you're going to be able then at nine o'clock in the morning when your office hours are done to do whatever it is you do between nine and, and three or four. So give yourself structure in the day so that you don't feel that you constantly have to log on and check email and check a discussion forum or check an assignment Dropbox. So be kind to yourself. It will reduce your anxiety. Your students are going to be a lot happier knowing when you're going to be online. Um, anxiety will be drastically reduced and learning will increase. What you want to do additionally is set consistent expectations for your students and for yourself, of course. You want to set your expectations in writing. Don't assume students know. So I'm gonna give you an example, um, and you can, you can take this example and apply it to your work. I work in a learning management system called Blackboard. Some of you might know it, some of you might not. And I had an email from a teacher, a faculty member, and he wrote to me and he said, I don't know, what to do, I can't see the student assignments in my course site. That was his email. He assumed that I knew who he was and what he was teaching, and I had no idea. So I wrote back and I said to him, what course are you talking about? 
what week are you talking about? What assignment are you talking about? So I was asking him to give me details in writing about what I, information I needed. So when you give students an assignment, make sure you're really, really clear with your expectations. Spell it out. Think about the types of questions that they would ask you in class if you were given that assignment and build it into your written assignments. So don't assume, don't assume students know, they don't. Um, and if they think they know, they still might have questions. So be really clear in writing what your expectations are. As much as possible, you want your due dates throughout the week to be as consistent as possible. So for example, if you have a weekly discussion with your students in the, in the discussion forum in the learning management system, and you want students to respond to one question or two, whatever it is, make sure that you're consistent so that every week that you have a discussion, it's due by Wednesday or Thursday or Friday, uh, 1 p.m., 2 p.m., 3 p.m., whatever it is, but make sure that week to week, you're consistent in your due dates and due times. If you have a test, make sure that you give your tests whatever day of the week, Friday, that's a terrible day for a test. Friday, that it's due before 4 p.m., whatever it is, but be consistent. So that way students will kind of get into the rhythm of what your online classroom looks like. Use a consistent assignment submission format. Do you want students to use a Dropbox in the site? Do you want students to email you their assignments? Whatever it is, be consistent. <clears throat> I would recommend using a Dropbox in a course site. <coughs> Excuse me. If you have rubrics, use them. Students like to know how they're going to be assessed. And give consequences for non-participation. So let your students know um, if they're not going to log in and participate and do work, the consequences will be for um, one day of late material, a reduction of 10% or three points, whatever it is. Let students know what the consequences are if they don't do the work on time. Don't assume students know, they don't. Students in class ask lots of questions. Predict the types of questions they might ask and address them in the course site in writing. Students who know what to do and how to behave online will be more successful. So make sure you give them every opportunity to be the best students they can be. Another thing you should know, there's a lot of research showing a link between student academic dishonesty and unclear teacher expectations. So the more clear you a teacher is or a faculty member is, um, the less academic dishonesty violations tend to happen in the classroom. The more unclear a teacher might be in his or her or their expectations, the more, uh, there's more research to show that students engage in academic dishonesty. So think about being clear in writing, not just in terms of helping the student, but also in preventing academic dishonesty. Clear expectations, less cheating. Establish a student learning contract. And usually this happens in two ways. So again, we're getting to the point of letting students know what to expect. So there are no surprises, so they don't feel anxious, and so they're more available to learn. So two best practices are to have a netiquette and an academic honesty contract. And we'll talk about these. Let's start with some creating um, age appropriate agreements. You know the age of the students you're teaching and you can write language that, that is appropriate for them. But here's one that I use, a confirmation of attendance. The student will just check off each little, each little bullet point. The student says, I've read the syllabus, I understand it, and I agree to its term. I've read and understand the netiquette. 
I have read and agree to the terms of the academic honesty contract below. It's not below, but it is in the, in the classroom. I affirm that all the work submitted in this course shall be my own work unless specifically stated otherwise. And I agree that I'll check my college email or school email account frequently for communication from my instructor or teacher. Now here, this was the below part. This is the academic honesty contract. And um, every school might have their own, every teacher might have their own, but here are just some kind of basic academic honesty contract clauses. So I'll leave them up, but I'm not going to read them. You can go back and look at this or come up with your own. So write an academic honesty contract if you don't have one. We're gonna move on to reducing student anxiety through the organization of your academic content. Um, you hear me say again and again, be consistent. And you do have to be consistent. And you want to come up with a consistent approach for organizing your academic content. The best practice for organizing academic content content is a weekly approach. I know that some teachers in, in our minds as educators, we organize information possibly by chapter or unit or outcome, etc. But all of those are schemas that are less intuitive for students. In the online environment, students, especially middle school through college, do best when their content is organized in a weekly approach. Um, the reason for this is that in the online environment, there's so much happening in their day. They're trying to juggle a number of different things. A daily approach can be overwhelming for them, um, but when they know what a weekly workload is going to look like, they can fit it into their plans, their circadian rhythms, the plans of the family, um, the structures of the family and the resources of the family. So, be consistent. You're going to create predictable learning spaces. And here are some examples of what that might look like. Make sure that you organize your content in a structured way, in the same way, every, every week or day or whatever method you choose. Make sure you have a weekly overview, weekly readings, weekly videos, additional weekly materials, a weekly discussion forum, weekly assignments and weekly tests. So you're gonna use this consistent structure, lesson planning structure, week after week in all of your online classrooms. So here's an example. This is just a Blackboard example. Week one, I've got my week title. I'm gonna put in my dates. Week two, I've got my title. I'll put in dates. Week three, week four, week five. So when students log on, they can see, ah, the content is being organized by week. It's not a scroll of death or um, a random, depending on what the teacher came up with, type of content organization. When you open those folders, you're going to structure, going back a slide, you're going to structure your weekly information like like this, weekly overview, readings, videos, material, discussion forum, assignments, tests. This is just the way I do it. It's, it's pretty much a best practice. You might have um, different, different things that you might want to include in your content structure or renaming it. But when I click on week one, week two, week three, week four, it's gonna look exactly the same for the students. And here's a little snapshot of um, Blackboard. I've got an overview. Here's my weekly overview. There are my required readings, followed by required videos that I have for them. Um, and then below that, all the, all the other um, clauses are, are filled in for the week. So students know exactly what to expect. There are no surprises in my course room, nor should there be. Any change, positive or negative, is going to cause anxiety in the student and possibly confusion especially when you add stuff. If the student thinks they're only going to have um, two readings and three videos, and all of a sudden you go and you add stuff, you're gonna really upset them and they're going to feel anxious and they're going to be much less likely to want to log in and participate. 
So we've covered a lot and we're going to cover um, another thing before this session ends. We're going to talk about how to engage students in an environment where they might be feeling anxiety. So our students are um, native digital learners, but um, they can still feel a tremendous amount of anxiety when it comes to digital learning. But the research on online learning is really clear. Students learn best through engagement. They learn best in the online environment when they engage with the teacher, so student to teacher engagement. They learn best when they engage with their fellow students, student to student engagement. And as you know, they learn best in their engagement with the academic material, so student to academic content engagement. So think about how you're going to incorporate all three elements each week. Student to teacher engagement, student to student engagement, and of course, student to content engagement. The best place for engagement is in the discussion forum. And um, for those of you who don't know what a discussion forum is, a discussion forum is a tool that's used in an online classroom. It's called the forum or the, um, it's usually called the forum. And it allows for students to interact with you and their fellow classmates in virtual time. So non-real time. It's a text-based writing tool. So it's a bit like a blog. So the best place for engagement is in the discussion forum. And what you're going to do is you're going to come up with questions for the students that are lively, fun, engaging. What you don't want to do in a discussion forum where you're asking a question is to use lower level Bloom's taxonomy questions. So if you ask a question in the discussion forum and you know it's the students are regurgitating information that they need to know, you know that if you've got 20 students and you ask a question and they all respond in the same way because there is only one possible answer, that no one's going to want to read it. It's flat, it's boring, it's dull. Students aren't really engaging. You want to think about questions for engagement in the written discussion forum that are creative questions, higher level Bloom's taxonomy questions, questions where students can demonstrate application of knowledge. So a bit more about that later on. So the discussion forum is the tool used to replicate open asynchronous discussion. The expectation is that all of your students read your discussion forum question and they also read the responses from fellow students. The teacher poses a question, they write a question, the students respond to the teacher in writing, and then the students respond to each other. Now they don't have to respond to 20 posts from each other, they might pick two or three or one, whatever it is you want them to do. So where do you find the discussion forum post? Here's a Blackboard and a Moodle example. In Blackboard, on the left, you can see it's in the dark blue menu called Discussion Board. In Moodle, it's a tool and it's called the forum. Um, so you would pick your forum and then um, write your question associated with it. Best practice for the discussion forum. Make sure you create a discussion forum um, opportunity where students can ask you their questions publicly. So it's a bit like open office hours, but it's open office hours in writing. So my questions discussion forum looks like this. I encourage you, the student, to use this forum to post any course related questions you might be having. Oftentimes, more than one student has the same question. So by asking it here, I can address it in a more timely manner. Now I'm gonna give them some guidelines so they know how to ask a question in writing for a frequently asked question type of thing. When posting a question, please be sure to add a new discussion topic and include the subject in the forum name so that others can see at a glance what you're asking. So here's a little bit about giving them really clear directions in writing about what I want. All students are invited to answer questions. 
Now I've let them know this is a public space. This is not a confidential forum. Questions about grades or other personal issues should be addressed through email. And now because I'm not a technology person, I'm writing, if you are having a technology challenge, please submit a request through the My Help Desk link at the top of the page. And different schools will have different processes for technology um, types of questions. So creating presence on the discussion forum. You've let students know when you're going to be present in the course site. You've let them know that they are required to participate in the discussion forum. You've got a general open question section in the discussion forum. And now you have to think about your written guidelines for student responses on the discussion forum. Your best practice, if a student posts, if they respond to your question, which they should on the discussion forum, make sure you respond to every student at least once and comment on something that they've written about. Remember, this is public. So don't be too critical. If they've written something well, you might say, I really liked your, um, your description of how you would apply blah, -de blah, whatever the concept is. Ask students a follow-up question so that you can get to the crux of how much they know in more detail. And if they respond to your follow-up question, which they should, follow up again and little end the, end the conversation. Faculty and teachers who use the discussion forum online find that this takes a lot of time. So the written discussion forum often replicates the classroom discussion. It does take time and if you have a good discussion forum going on, um, it's where you're going to spend the bulk of your time as a teacher. So don't be discouraged the first time you do it. It can feel painful responding in writing to what you might have said to a student quite quickly in the classroom. Remember, you also don't have your visual cues for the student in the discussion forum because it's all text-based. So you're gonna find ways to express yourself in writing to let the students know that you're engaging with them. So get into the habit of using the discussion forum, especially with older students who are more proficient writers. It's a lot of fun, but it's also a lot of work. Won't, I won't pretend it's easy. Some ideas for discussion forum questions. Consider role playing scenarios. So if you're teaching a history class, have students pretend they're a character from history. I don't know, Napoleon or um, Queen Elizabeth I or, or whoever it is you're reading about in class. So have them discuss a particular issue or pick from particular issues <coughs> and have them take on a role playing scenario. Another example of an idea is you can have students write a letter from the perspective of somebody. And if you're teaching science classes, you can have them write a letter from the perspective of a virus. So hello, my name is blah -de blah virus and this is what I do. And then you can write, have students write back from another perspective, um, from the perspective of um, an antibacterial something or another. I don't have a biology background. So that way the students are applying knowledge through a very fun and more interactive way. Um, you're engaging them, they're engaging with each other and they're demonstrating knowledge at the same time. You can ask students um, to upload a video of themselves talking about something or they can find it on the web. You can give them case studies to respond to and you can give them hypothetical scenarios. So example, how would you respond if you were in whatever situation? So you really apply the hypothetical scenario to your, your particular discipline or your content and get the students engaged in the discussion forum. Response criteria in the discussion forum Remember, the students should engage with you and they should engage with each other. So always have students respond to one or two other students. So build that into your assignment description. 
If you see that some students are being left out of discussion forums, it's a good practice to pick a stronger student. So for example, if Margie is a very strong student, she, um, she writes well, she understands the material, but then you have another student, Peter, who's less, less strong, no one's responding to him, you might write to Margie, hey Margie, um, take a look at what Peter wrote, how would you respond to his thoughts? So kind of you facilitate that interaction in writing in the same way that you might in a group assignment in the classroom. Um, in writing, I've got my, my requirements for my students. My discussion forum is due by Wednesday of this week, because remember I organize by week, by noon, and replies to two other students by Saturday of this week by noon. If you're working across time zones, which you're probably not, you might put in Eastern Standard Time, just so there can be absolutely no questioning of when your due dates and due times are. So here's my example of response criteria to students. <coughs> I'm not gonna read it, but I've stated very clearly what I don't accept. So I've told students at the bottom, responses such as good job, or you said it all, so I have nothing left to say, are not acceptable. So you really want students to respond in a substantive way. So in summary, um, we've created a very structured virtual classroom. You've established your presence. You've given them written guidelines for behavior and participation. You've let them know what the consequences are for non-participation um, and negative participation. You've organized your content in a very structured way that students know what to expect. And you've set up rigid, well, maybe they're not rigid, but very strong structured approaches for engagement and interaction in the virtual classroom. So now when your students log on and they know when you're going to log on, they know what to expect. They know what your virtual digital teaching and learning environments look like. So their anxiety and their level of insecurity is going to be very diminished and they're going to be available to learn. So if this were a live session, I would say, do you have any questions? But it's not a live session. So if you do have any questions, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. You can write to lisa.hayward at doe.nh.gov. I'm happy to come and talk to you through Zoom or um, email or telephone call, whatever works for you. I hope this was useful. I know I packed a lot of content into a very fast moving brief session, but all right, you know what to do and um, best practices are out there. Try to have fun and have a great day now.